everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our final talk of the term and of 2020. Um, today we have with us Claire Fox, who is the Baroness of Buckley, uh, and is also currently running the Academy of Ideas, who's responsible for running the Battle of Ideas Festival, which a lot of us went to um, last year. Um, I'm going to let uh, Claire basically jump right in with everything that that we're going to start off with and then as usual we'll have a Q&A at the end so anything you've heard anything else that you want to say um, I'll give a quick explanation of how that's going to work at the end um, but yeah I think I'll I'll let Claire shoot off. Uh, thank you Tom and I'm getting an echo now actually by the way but anyway thank you Tom and thanks for inviting me um, it's a real shame I can't be with you in real life and I've spent a lot of the last um, few months arguing that universities have been too risk averse and should do more face to face teaching. So I hope that you'll invite me back in the flesh sometime because I do think that interaction via Zoom is just not the same. Anyway, you're a free speech society and I've written extensively on free speech. It's very much my passion and there isn't a day goes by, as we know, where there isn't some free speech issue that we could discuss, whether it's sacking someone from Eton or whether it's the Cambridge University uh, uh, Charter, which is uh, antagonistic to free speech or any number of things, right? We could go on and on. So I wanted to just try and raise some issues that I've been thinking about in lockdown and in a way that are related to lockdown. And just by way of, a, of, of an introduction to say, I'm trying to raise a few things that are a bit new um, and or that for you to mull over. And also I am very hostile to what I think has become a completely disproportionate response to the pandemic, but this is not uh, a requirement that you all agree with me. And it's not really a discussion about lockdown. It's a discussion about the way the discussion about lockdown has been conducted. So um, I'm also not very good at giving speech <laughs> I can't do them on the screen. So I've got lots of pieces of paper. So forgive me for the lack of professionalism. But anyway, right, I'll carry on. Okay. Um, in an emergency like a pandemic, when society is facing a genuinely frightening and unpredictable threat, which undoubtedly COVID-19 is, I would think that freedom of speech should be a real democratic asset. You know, even when we've been locked down at home, in some ways, uh, it's important that free speech wasn't locked down and that the public could use new technology such as Zoom to hear a variety of voices from medicine and science uh, to assess contradictory evidence, to hear all the different views as to how we might deal with this uh, uh, um, pandemic, because it's obviously unprecedented and therefore you'd think that a collective sharing of ideas about what to do would be encouraged by uh, uh, the people who run society and by politicians. But also, you know, lockdown and even tiering and all the rest of it has created a huge amount of isolation and fragmentation, people being lonely and on their own and you can't go down the pub and chat with people, you can't have meetings to discuss things. So in some ways, you'd also think that free speech would be helpful because it would encourage a kind of community dialogue so that people would feel less isolated and kind of give a sort of sense of collective endeavor uh, um, and as basic as how you might help the people down the street but just generally kind of create a mood that would counter the isolation that comes from the measures that have been brought in but instead what's happened is actually COVID has become associated with a very severe uh, free speech crisis, in my opinion, and uh, they're the kind of things I want to look at. And don't get me wrong, uh, the vast majority of people in the country, I think, especially at the beginning, accepted that this public health emergency would require restrictions on everyday freedoms. And even people who are called libertarians, like me, it's not a phrase I particularly like, but you know, who are in, make an issue about freedom, we're happy to have a, a um, a temporary abeyance of freedoms if that was what was going to help. And um, we were in a way encouraged, and I think rightly to, to give up some aspects of freedom as an act of social solidarity. 
But I think that's quickly turned into a demand for an intellectual lockdown and a silencing of dissent that's much more problematic. And I think more broadly, has it's worth noting how in this period, this last eight, nine months, how quickly orthodoxy set in and uh, dissent is delegitimized. Um, just to use one example, the COVID legislation that was brought in was undoubtedly draconian. And you might think it was necessary, but it was so far reaching in terms of uh, the attacks on civil liberties that I thought it was only right, and there was a group of us who thought this, that one might suggest a sunset clause. Now, I don't know if you remember this, because at, at the time they were just indefinite. And so some of them were saying, can't you review these after a few months? And I thought this was a perfectly reasonable, moderate uh, thing to say that you would have some scrutiny and vigilance about the state accruing so much power. But it, I was shocked at the ferociousness of the response, which was to be um, basically subject to widespread ridicule and accused of recklessly caring more about civil liberties than lives. Um, and so you got this sort of sense of uh, uh, lockdown conformism, a kind of implacable rage that um, anyone who deviated from shutting down society and, econ uh, econ ec and the economy uh, was seen to be irresponsible and had to be dealt with. So I think that we then saw <coughs> quite early on the start of a bout of very serious censoriousness. One of the ways that that was done was through delegitimizing um, dissidents who didn't go along with things. So I wanted to use an example of Laura Paris, who is uh, uh, the co-editor of Conservative Women, a former barrister. Um, I disagree with her. She's a real lockdown skeptic right from the start. Um, and she, but she wrote this, she said, the extended lockdown is not lawful. The prime minister is incapacitated and didn't make the decision, uh, didn't make the decisions. Uh, Parliament isn't sitting. So this was the first lockdown, of course. Uh, uh, the original aim of the first lockdown has now been met. Uh, civil disobedience would be justified. That's what she said. This is, by the way, conservative women barrister calling for civil disobedience. So it just shows you that politics has gone bonkers for a start off. But, you know, I didn't, as I say, agree with her. But I noticed that very quickly in mainstream media, she was labelled as a crackpot truther, a lockdown denier and, quote, batshit crazy, which I thought was over the top myself. But it was a way of dealing with dissent uh, that became quite widespread, which was any deviation from a particularly narrow uh, 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 narrative was met with a kind of shut up fury. And anyone who expressed concern over democratic freedoms were, were dismissed and denounced often as uh, conspiracy mongers. Um, now, first of all, I'd like to say that I do think there, has, there is a problem of a growing number of conspiracy theories that have developed around coronavirus. Actually, I'd like your opinions on that in the Q&A, how one deals with that, because there are some, there it is true that there are some utterly, utterly bonkers ideas floating around. And in some ways, because we're in lockdown, they've developed a certain momentum that one wouldn't expect. But I noted again quite early on that Hope Not Hate brought out a report on the prevalence of 5G conspiracy theories, if you remember that was quite prevalent at the beginning that this was all to do with 5G. And um, they noted, uh, hope not hate, noted an exponential growth of the idea that, um, and, you know, it is true that there were, I think there were 50 arsons attack, arson attacks just over the Easter weekend. Um, uh, basically people trying to destroy uh, uh, the, the source of 5G but you all, all know that there are Facebook groups that somehow link all this to Bill Gates and anti-vaxxers and uh, paedophile rings and all sorts of things uh, and so on. And David Icke has become quite a, you know, it's almost like a mainstream figure. And hope not, uh, but however, hope not, hey, fitted all this into a neat box of the usual villains, uh, said it was the growth of far-right anti-Semitism, which was a stretch too far for me. Uh, they said uh, they said that they were mainly all Trump supporters and Brexiteers and racists. So it basically became kind of lumping everyone together as the bad guys. And as I stood as a Brexit party candidate and was elected as MEP, I obviously object to anyone who voted Brexit being thrown into the box with 
uh, um, all of those different categories. In other words, it became very quickly a kind of culture wars rather than a serious conversation. But the main thing was, was that anyone therefore who asked any questions immediately got lumped in with these kind of conspiracy theories who at the beginning at least were a, a smallish group but have grown, uh, have grown over the time. But what did Hope Not Hate call for? And this is the most important thing was Hope Not Hate didn't call for an argument against these conspiracy theories, didn't call for any kind of open discussion. It immediately said that what we needed was uh, censorship. We needed to remove any posts by any of these people from social media. Uh, it, it called on uh, uh, big tech to uh, uh, to remove any posts or, or, or ban any posts that quote miscite. Uh, insight mistrust, not just of the government, but of healthcare providers, scientists, and public institutions. Now think about that. They're saying that you should remove anybody who it says incites mistrust, not only in the government, but healthcare providers, scientists, and public institutions. That is effectively political censorship. I want to be able to criticize the government. I mean, this was quite early on, but nonetheless, healthcare providers, that would mean that you couldn't uh, criticise Public Health England, and goodness knows, I think they've got plenty to be criticised for. But anyway, it's legitimate that one should be able to, of any scientist. So is it the science then? You can only have one approach and so on and so forth. Um, actually, um, I think that what's ironic about this is that there are, uh, the prevalence of conspiratorial thinking um, is not just from the far right fringes, um, but it's been mainstream. This is what's so ironic about it. Um, for example, um, when Boris was um, in hospital, do you remember uh, somebody said, uh, this is not someone who was at death's door a few days ago. And that was somebody who was the Europe editor of The Economist, basically saying that Boris had never been ill at all. Uh, there's been all sorts of conspiracy theories, uh, actually from quite mainstream people um, who, who said that uh, Boris's baby was too big the Financial Times columnist Francis Coppola said, oh, what a surprise. He discharged himself on Easter Sunday. I have no doubt he was seriously ill, but this was stage managed to make it look as if he was Jesus. It's ridiculous. And the reason I'm using that was because nobody was calling for those bonkers conspiracy thoughts to be closed down. So it was very much aimed at a particular type of dissent, uh, whereas actually I think that that conspiratorial thinking is problematic more generally, and I don't think any of it should be closed down. I think that, you know, in a pandemic in particular, or in an emergency, uh, some crisis facing society, we need to have as wide a series of views available as possible, because that would guard against our own tendency for confirmation bias and for embracing dogma. And I think that this is actually true of politicians as well. Um, rendering um, uh, uh, alternative views, um, it seems, oh no, sorry, alternative views, it seems to me, is, are an antidote to fixed orthodoxies. I think it's very important that there isn't just assumed to be one strategy that would be able to deal with every single thing that this pandemic has, has, has thrown up. But in any situation, by having a, a, a access to a wide range of views, it always means that you're constantly having to ask yourself, am I wrong? Should I reevaluate? Uh, what if the government has chosen the wrong path? Uh, there must be a, a course, uh, there must be a chance to change course. And you can only do that if you're considering all the different options. And so it seems to me to have been completely counterproductive to have rendered all of these alternative views as delegitimized. And, and demonizing them, because it actually means that you can get stuck in only going down one route. So I think that the first thing I'd say is that we need to have the humility not to assume that our strongly held views, even about something like a pandemic, are the only ones that we should hear. And of course it can feel demoralizing when you face lots of information that you don't understand, endless data, graphs, forecasts, and so on. You're kind of like, in some ways, it wouldn't it be nice if we only had one view of the world and somebody could show us the graph and that would be the answer. But actually that simplistic response is a way of abdicating our responsibility as free citizens, because I think we actually have to be able to weigh up all of the different information and, and, and take a look at it. 
But anyway, the politicians didn't trust us to do that. It seemed to me that politicians of all political parties, by the way, were worried that the public might alight on theories or ideas that were at odds with their uh, determination to pursue uh, fighting this pandemic in a particular way. And sadly, they chose to go along with this idea of closing down debate. It wasn't just hope, not hate, that was calling for the banning of posts, for example. So the government recruited big tech companies really to act as the thought police and appointed them as arbiters of what could and couldn't be said about the nature of the virus or the best way to fight it. And, um, you know, again, it wasn't just a, a, a kind of cranks who were kind of being censored, but a wide range of uh, quite respectable scientists found that their videos or their films and so on were taken down. So I'm not trying to suggest that I'm in any way on a par with uh, some leading virologists, but you know, if, if I, it would be like putting this film out and then Facebook just saying, no, this is misinformation, close it down. That's effectively what's happened. And there's been a range of people who are prominent uh, science commentators and uh, medical commentators who disagree with the, uh, the, the, the mainstream view on how the virus should be dealt with, who have found that they've been treated as though they're 5G conspiracy cranks which is incredibly bad for their reputation. It introduces them as being lunatics. And I think it's a, a very unhelpful situation. You know, Facebook has got a, a somebody who um, is the vice president of integrity, uh, Guy uh, uh, Rosen. And they Facebook have taken to dubbing anything that goes against the official recommendation of the World Health Organization as uh, misinformation. But Guy Rosen made this point. He said, we're going to start showing messages in the newsfeed to people who have liked, reacted or commented on harmful misinformation about COVID-19. We want to connect these people who may have interacted with harmful misinformation on the virus with the truth from alternative services. So this really is Facebook appointing themselves as the truth finder generals and deciding what it is that you should know, what is the truth and so on. And I would suggest to you that that is a dangerous situation for us to be in and one that we as people interested in free speech should be very wary of. I also think that this has created a mood of intolerance about uh, other people's views. And if anything, the more that this censorship has gone on, actually the more conspiratorial thinking it's created because inevitably if a video appears and is much liked and shared and then suddenly Facebook remove it because it doesn't fit in with what they've decided the truth is immediately people will say what are they trying to hide there is a conspiracy there's all these powers that be uh, and so on and so forth I was particularly disappointed that when it came to a discussion on the vaccination the new vaccinations which it seems to me are, are a tribute to human ingenuity, uh, the, the wonders of medical science uh, are really fantastic that these vaccinations have been created so swiftly. Um, and you would want, I would personally want everyone to enthusiastically want to have the vaccinations because isn't it fantastic that we as a human species have managed to come up with something to deal with this a horrible uh, virus that we're facing. I would therefore imagine that everybody would be going out trying to sell the wonders of vaccinations against any cynicism and win people's hearts and minds and be very positive. But sadly, um, if you look at, for example, the way the Labour Party have dealt with this, the Labour Party shadow culture minister, Joe Stevens and the shadow health secretary, Jonathan uh, Ashworth, have written to the government calling for censorship of anti-vaccine misinformation. And they've said the government has a pitiful trade re um, uh, uh, track record on taking action against online platforms that are facilitating the spread of disinformation. This is literally a, mat literally a matter of life and death. And anyone who is dissuaded from being vaccinated because of this uh, one person is one person too many. So they've said that this is literally a matter of life and death. They have demanded that the government uh, actually uh, impose financial and criminal pen penalties on any of the big tech providers who don't remove what they say is disinformation 
or uh, uh, negative uh, um, at attitudes in relation to the vaccines. Now, apart from the fact that I think this is going to backfire terribly, already it has. Immediately, people think they've been coerced into taking a vaccine. It doesn't work in any, you know, I always think that the behavioural scientists advising the government don't understand anything about behaviour. That's one thing I've learned during this pandemic. But anyway, the, everything they do just sort of creates this mood of, well, why are they forcing us to take this vaccine? Why are they removing information that might give us information about it? and so on and so forth? So I don't think it works. But I wanted to particularly stress that point about saying that disinformation was literally a matter of life and death because I want to uh, move on to note that free speech during this COVID uh, period has been accused of threatening people's lives. And if you're interested in free speech, this is a big step forward or backward, depending on which way you, you look at it, because free speech is now said to be a matter of life and death. It's a particular challenge to us. Now think about it, historically, we've always understood that there's a distinction between physical threats and violence from speech, however aggressive. No matter how incendiary words might be, it's been accepted that that's not the same as bombs or bullets or knives. And we obviously have the sticks and stones don't break my bones. Now I appreciate that your generation, students uh, particularly at the moment, have there's been a new phase in which actually uh, uh, the, over the last decade particularly, harm and safety have been much more uh, elastic concepts and have blurred the line between physical harm and metaphysical or, 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 or psychological harm. And words are taken uh, as equivalent to uh, physical violence in, in many instances. So J.S. Mill's harm principle has become an ever expansive category to justify censorship and is usually deployed using the language of mental health to justify silencing offensive views. Uh, words are harmful psychologically. The whole concept behind safe spaces is to protect the vulnerable and minority groups from psychological damage. Um, on US campuses, there's something called assaultive speech, uh, assaultive speech, and um, uh, trigger warnings uh, that kind of much discussed are said to, uh, to be necessary because words or certain ideas can trigger post-traumatic stress disorder. So I am aware of the fact that that distinction between words and violence has been slowly eroded. But it does seem to me that it's come to a real uh, head at the moment and kind of become even more dangerously medicalized. I noticed um, uh, in, uh, you know, the, 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 the shift, if you want, has got to such a point that speech is now pathologized in an article entitled, When is Speech Violence? Uh, by uh, Prof Professor of Psychology, Lisa Feldman Barrett. Uh, she wrote, and it's a, a big study, words can have a power powerful effect on your nervous system. Certain types of versely, even those involving no physical contact, can make you sick and shorten your life. That slippery slope elision of speech and violence has really, really now, I think, solidified in relation to COVID because safety has been put as the key value in society above all else. And, you know, whenever I raise anything like free speech in the House of Lords or anywhere else, uh, people al already say, uh, yes, but what about safety? Safety trumps everything else, right? And of course, Safety now, as I say, is keeping you safe from certain ideas, keeping you protected and safe from this violent speech. Speech is presented then, as the Labour Party did, as a literal, visceral threat to physical well-being. And dissenting views are said to be responsible for deaths. Uh, people are described as dangerous disinformation spreaders and, as one journalist wrote, tantamount to accessories in manslaughter. So you really have got the kind of full gamut there of a dangerous move, I think. Um, I do think that this association of bad ideas with actual loss of life is one of the worst outcomes of this period. Um, and in a way, um, I think it's something that we're going to have to learn to untangle afterwards. Um, when people ask the question, what's more important to you, safety or health or, or freedom? I think that 
you know, I still want to be able to say I want to be a free person. I don't want to be blackmailed into this idea that I'm a granny killer or, a, a, you know, responsible for manslaughter because I have an opinion that's different to the government. So, again, something uh, to discuss. But there's an irony in all this because all the people I had this argument with through the first lockdown suddenly changed their view when politics changed. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the Black Lives Matters issue and how that changed everything, but also raised some interesting issues during COVID. Because if you remember, I mean, obviously we, none of us are going to forget the brutal killing of George Floyd, the international reaction, which I think was uh, merited in many ways. I went on uh, uh, Black Lives Matters demo myself, but uh, of course I went on Black Lives Matters demonstrations with people who had basically said that you couldn't leave the house or you'd kill granny. So the whole thing got a bit peculiar for a bit of a period of time. And uh, suddenly safe spaces, health, words can kill was like, this is more important than safety. This is an important issue, which as it happens, I agreed with them. But um, it's incredible to bear in mind that very quickly, what should have been an opportunity to discuss racism, to discuss police brutality, to discuss the differences between the UK and the United States in terms of racism, turned into, guess what, yet another free speech crisis. And this is the irony of the whole thing. I remember really feeling this very clearly when uh, uh, the chief reporter of the Western Mail, uh, Martin Shipton, was forced to step down as a judge of the Wales Book of the Year competition. Uh, Martin Shipton was um, a, a liberal commentator, you know, kind of, you know, not the kind of person he wasn't kind of going around saying all lives matters or anything provocative at all. What was his crime that forced him to uh, 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 have to step down? What happened was that he said on a radio programme that he didn't think that people should go on a Black Lives Matters demonstration in Cardiff because it was breaking lockdown and that they should think about the safety of others. And he was accused of appeasing racism and if they, and he, Basically, the poor guy haplessly suddenly got mired in being a racist because he was defending what had been the orthodoxy a week before and he hadn't caught up with the new orthodoxy, which was that you had to go on a demonstration to prove that you were not a racist. And I think it's just the speed with which uh, that crisis in the middle of the pandemic crisis uh, turned again into another free speech issue and how one set of orthodoxies, which was that you have to go along with lockdown, you're not allowed to challenge the uh, orthodoxies being put forward over here, suddenly became a new set of tenants and it's uh, unquestionable uh, orthodoxies, uh, particularly in relation to those dictated by Black Lives Matters as an organisation, not the general sort of sense of Black Lives uh, Mattering. So one conformist position uh, in which you were cancelled if you disagreed was replaced with another conformist uh, uh, position in which you were cancelled if you disagreed, which shows that free speech is always very uh, vulnerable in all of these situations. Now, the new orthodoxy in relation to Black Lives Matters was that you signed up to Black Lives Matters orthodoxies or else. They became, as you know, unquestionable in many instances. So another example was the chief executive and CEO of Manchunian Way, who uh, wrote a blog um, uh, uh, and was sacked for doing so. The thing that was significant was he was the CEO of a charity that he set up working with the homeless and inner city youth, uh, a multiracial group of uh, clients that he worked with. And he said that he didn't like Black Lives Matters orthodoxies. He wrote this blog. There was a, uh, um, a 400 people signed a petition saying that this showed that he was a racist. And the trustees of the charity that he set up sacked him in a week. 
Now, as it happens, he got his job back because he it, it, it hit the national press. But it took weeks and well, it took months, in fact, uh, for that to happen. But you will all now be familiar, and I hardly need go through this, that very quickly there were certain things that you had to go along with. You know, you had to say that you thought that the Colston statue should be pulled down in Bristol, otherwise you were pro-slavery. You had to go along with certain uh, things, in the, or you would be accused of being racially insensitive and I and I just think it became you know a, a, an orthodoxy uh, very quickly and I think it's worth noting then that censorship is not always and actually in the present time very rarely is a state clampdown on ideas. John Stuart Mill talked about the tyranny of prevailing opinion the the tyranny of a pre prevailing opinion and feeling and I think that's very important, that sense of the prevailing opinion and feeling being a tyranny. I do think that there are orthodoxies that suddenly get set in stone and you have to sign up to them in order to prove that you are of the right side. And so you have to sign up to a variety of highly contentious ideas about racism and about race and identity in this period, or you're labelled as racist and bigoted. And so I wanted to, to dwell on a little bit something that is an extension of where we were before, which was this idea that speech is violence, which is the new slogan in town, which is that silence is violence. This is the idea that you have to have a mandated, you are mandated to speak and to agree with a particular outlook. Major organizations have in the last few months compelled their staff to um, have certain conversations about, uh, about race. This is not about encouraging debate in case you think it is, because that would be interesting. You know, you would hope in a way that the brutal killing of George Floyd would make people think, let's sit around and discuss this. I don't mind uh, leaderships of uh, different uh, multinationals or anyone else saying let's talk about racism but that is not what happened for example one of the uh, one major arts organization i know and these are now well documented in the press but sent round mandated readings uh, white fragility by robin d'angelo uh, which i'm sure you're all uh, familiar with uh, uh, remy uh, edo lodge's book why i'm no longer talking to white people about race, these became issued by the CEOs of organization as must read. Now this, is, uh, this isn't like an interesting reading list. This is the books you must read, the ideas you must accept. And in one instance in a major, one of the major accountancy companies in this country, there was a top-down CEO organized discussion on these, why people should read these books and what attitudes people should take to Black Lives Matters because uh, the company was saying that they wanted to uh, sign up to Black Lives Matters. And in the chat, um, somebody objected and said they didn't think it was appropriate for accountants to be making political statements like this. By the way, the, C, the senior management team had encouraged people to put their comments in the chat because they said there should be a discussion. As soon as that comment was put in the chat about why they shouldn't sign up to Black Lives Matters, the person who wrote in the chat was rounded on by quite senior people in the company who in the chat basically said that these views were unacceptable. Another member of staff who was an anti-bullying representative felt that the person who was being rounded on was being bullied. So he defended the person he, was, he felt was being bullied in the chat, even though he didn't agree with him because he supported Black Lives Matters. Both the person who said that they objected to Black Lives Matters and the person who defended the person who was being bullied for not saying the right thing were immediately suspended by the company. This is a regular and frequent occurrence. And some of us set up an initiative called Don't Divide Us. There's also the Free Speech Union. We have been drowning in people contacting us 
whose jobs have been on the line because they didn't go along with a certain narrative. And the point of the silence is violence was that they were not being encouraged, as I say, to speak up, but to speak up and follow a particular script. So you will know about the way that arts organizations um, encouraged everybody to put black squares around their Instagram uh, at a particular time, which is, you know, superficial box ticking in some ways, but perfectly reasonable if you want to. What you might not know about is that the people who didn't do it were then reprimanded by senior management for not doing it and their motives queried. I think that this is a very dangerous situation to be in. And many universities have actually got themselves into this situation whilst you have not been having face-to-face -face lectures, senior management teams have uh, reorganized uh, uh, special training sessions for uh, lecturers about how they should decolonize the curriculum, uh, how um, they have to re uh, consider every single aspect of what they teach in, through the prism of white privilege and so on. And the reason I'm saying this is because, and you might, uh, uh, you know, be greatly sympathetic to critical race theory, any number of you listening, which is all fine. But I am an anti-racist of long standing. And there is a version of fighting racism um, that is very different to that which is being fashionably put forward as the anti-racist truth. Just like the science seems to me to be a real uh, betrayal of the scientific method uh, uh, in the COVID situation because there is no such thing as the science. I don't think there's any such thing as the uh, way to fight anti-racism. I think that this is an argument and a discussion um, and I object to being mandated to speak in a particular way. In an article called White Silence on Social Media, why is not saying anything actually saying a lot? The CEO for the Centre of Social Justice at University College Berkeley said, uh, Berkeley said uh, white silence is not neutral. It acts like a weapon. It's not even silent. It speaks volumes, right? It acts like a weapon. And I think that that's, again, it gets us back to this constant uh, way that words, or unless you say the right words, how free speech is being linked to uh, violence. And the whole silence is violence was immediately to say that if you weren't an active vocal ally, you were the equivalent of kneeling with your neck on, 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 the, black of, on the back of some black guy in America and killing them. That was what it was linked to. It was linked to George Floyd's brutal killing. You will have seen the viral videos that came out from the US of people descending on diners in restaurants demanding that they raise their fist um, and say, and, and the protesters were screaming, uh, 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 silence is violence. And people were in the invidious position of not knowing whether to put their fist in the air um, or if they didn't, whether they would be considered to be a bigot or not. And that's extreme and we don't have that here. But I get equally nervous about a fashion for race ambassadors that has particularly been embraced by universities and many institutions uh, that basically encourage mandated people to start healthy conversations and encourage those race ambassadors to encourage uh, to report on people who are, are, are saying things that are inappropriate and to correct them if they misspeak in any way. I think that this is a recipe for self-censorship and bad faith because when speech is curated by conformity, curated by other people's version of events, or it's stifled by the demand uh, that uh, or, uh, the demand that or the, the this idea that dissenting ideas are dangerous. I think what it leads to is it means that people conceal their opinions out of fear of a backlash. And I think it is not just that I, on principle, don't want free speech to be squashed, but it actually is completely uh, destroys any sense in which you can change the world for the best if you are always following a script and never actually saying what you believe to be true. Of course, where we have a situation where concealed opinions are now being rooted out uh, and an interpretation of what you don't say 
uh, as potentially a bigotry or a, 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 the equivalent of racist violence, then even one step further that's emerged is an interpretation of not just what you don't say, what you do say, but what you really think behind what you don't say, i.e. unconscious bias. And I want to kind of finish on unconscious bias training because that is also being mandated by many institutions now, this pseudoscientific implicit association test that infers that everyone, anyone who is white uh, can't escape from being racially biased, that you have to be uh, retrained in thinking in a particular way. Um, and the uh, whole way that um, uh, racism has now become, if you want, a political um, way of catching people out, kind of gotcha, I think is very dangerous. I don't know if people saw the Channel 4 series, The School That Tried to End Racism, where children who were all getting on with each other without any uh, 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 problems whatsoever, no matter what their ethnicity, their skin colour, were effectively segregated into different uh, identity groups, racial identity groups. And of course, children who were white were taught that they uh, had white privilege. Children who were not white were taught that they were the victims of people with white privilege and so on. And all the time I kept thinking this is just an anathema to Martin Luther, Luther King's uh, dream of judging people on their character and not their skin color. And just as I was thinking that the person who was presenting the documentary said, of course, there are those people who still believe that you should judge people on character and not on skin color. But that's just an example of their unconscious bias and bigotry. That is a racist uh, 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 idea in and of itself. And you just feel all the time like you're in some circular firing squad. Anyone who doesn't conform to a narrow view of race as dictated by critical race theory is denounced as in denial of their own white privilege. I, I say this because um, this all happened during COVID and I thought that the parallels were uh, uh, worth noting. And I suppose just to conclude, the question I want to ask is how we deal with a situation where no matter what the issue is, the first thing that always is sacrificed is free speech. No matter what the, the challenge to society is, why is it that people immediately grab the latest uh, uh, weapon in the free speech wars and how we can post COVID uh, really tackle this idea that ideas are so dangerous that they can kill you and that even your unconscious or your unspoken thoughts, your own motives can be impugned by trainers and experts and external forces uh, and interpreted far away from any motives you might have. And that will do for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, so I think that was that was an, an incredibly uh, comprehensive talk. Actually, thank you very much. Like that. There's, there's a lot of a uh, lot of things to unpack there. I think I've lost track of about half the questions that I thought I was going to ask you in the Q and A. Um, but yeah, I'll just uh, if, if you move move quickly onto the Q and A, I'll just give everyone a quick rundown of how all that's going to work. Um, so. If you look in the participants tab, um, for people who haven't been with us before, um, there is a little um, group of emojis that you can use. There's one which is a, a raise hand one or, or one that just says yes. Um, if you would like to ask um, a question, um, just feel free to click on one of those, raise your hand or click on that little yes thing and I'll know to come to you uh, and unmute. Um, but yes. I think, uh, yeah, everyone can, um, yeah, so anyone who wants to ask a question, do that. Um, I think I might be a bit selfish and ask one first, just because I've had, I've had quite a few and I know I'm going to forget them if I don't ask them now. So um, one of the ones uh, I was going to ask you is, is a little bit um, unrelated to um, what you said before. It's just more, I want to get a sense of um, your sort of, um, political journey because while I was researching for the talk I, I saw that you used to be part of the um, uh, I think it was the Revolutionary Communist Party um, and so I just wanted to sort of ask how somebody went from 
from being a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party to um, the sort of more, I know you said you didn't like the term libertarian, but that that kind of viewpoint, I was just really interested about that kind of political journey. Bloody mute buttons. We're all going to be go. having nightmares about mute buttons for the rest of our lives. Yeah. All right, right. Um, first of all, this political journey, which is only really being talked about because when I decided to stand as a Brexit party MEP, in order to discredit me, a lot of people went around saying she's a revolutionary communist, really. I mean, the revolutionary communist party did disband 23 years ago. You know, people will say things like she jumped from revolutionary communist party to Brexit party. You think it was that wasn't a jump. It was a meander for 23 years. Do you know what I mean? I've been quite um, yeah. for a start off. That's one thing. Secondly, don't assume you know what being in the revolutionary communist party one means. When I was at university, I um, infamously um, argued against no platform very unfashionably as a revolutionary communist party member because I always believed in free speech and um, many people associated with um, that organisation did throughout the whole time and for all the reasons that I'm a free speecher now I was a free speecher then as well and um, because I've always thought that um, the best way to deal with ideas that I disagreed with was to convince the audience that there were better ideas and not necessarily to try and win over the people that people were trying to know platform I mean I don't think that if somebody's invited Katie Hopkins to speak she should be no platformed because somebody else doesn't want to hear her. But, you know, it's not like I'm trying to convince Katie Hopkins of anything because I couldn't be bothered, right? However, if I was asked to debate her, then it would be for the audience I would do it. And free speech is as much about the listeners as it is, it is about the person. You're not trying to convince the person necessarily. You're having a dispute between two different ways of understanding the world uh, in front of a public audience. So, yes, the journey wasn't that great, really. Um, on the libertarian front, Again, libertarian is usually used as a term of um, insult by people on the left who are trying to discredit me and associate me with people on the right. But can I just say that, you know, there's not enough people on the left or the right who are pro-free speech or pro-freedom in my view, right? So I, can't, I hate all this finger pointing, it drives me mad. But, you know, in America, there's a tradition of left libertarianism as it happens. And there's a tradition of left free speeches. So when people say, oh, you're just a libertarian, it's a way of sort of going, you're like those IEA Adam Smith Institute people. Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with them if they exist, but I, as it happens, I disagree with them on things like the free market. So that's a different question. But libertarian is, is what I think is really sad is that the left have become so associated with censorious illiberal attacks on freedom. I think that's particularly sad because I'm from that tradition. It just drives me mad. And the truth is, when I hear somebody say, you know, as a, you know, as an anti-racist representing, you know, as an anti-racist and I want to fight on behalf of women, um, I know they're going to close something down. I mean, this is disastrous for me because I'm an anti-racist who fought in the women's liberation movement. And now I basically know that it's going to end up closing, banning someone. So uh, that, it seems to me, so labelling is not that helpful. And I would urge you all to get rid of any preconceptions about what you think Marxists are or right-wingers are, any of that, it doesn't help you. The most important thing to understand at the moment is that each party has completely compromised on this. And to think of our libertarian prime minister as we speak, allegedly, as they say, who then says, oh yeah, but I've decided I agree with the nanny state now and has basically been as liberal as you can possibly be. Judge people on what they say, not on the labels that they're given. And that's one thing all free speeches should do because otherwise you act like conspiratorial. You're trying to look behind to understand the motives. And that's the way both of madness, but it's the way of trying to delegitimize people and close them down. And there's been so many attempts at canceling me. It's boring. And it's usually through labels that it happens. Sometimes because they quote back at me stupid things I've said. Um, and sometimes yeah. because of things I believed in the past, which they want me to denounce now, and I refuse to denounce. But generally, it's all about trying to cancel me or anyone that they don't like, which is not the way to go. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go to Luke for the next question and then we'll go to Ayrton after. So Luke, and there we go. Can I mute yourself now, Matt? Thanks. Thank you for the um, talk, Claire. Um, just to kind of ask, um, I was wondering, what do you think is kind of given like rise to this sort of cancel, I guess you could call it cancel culture, or, you know, this trend of not letting people speak? Because I mean, some people have said, oh, well, it's people getting more radically left. But even people like Noam Chomsky, who is one of the most radical left thinkers, I think, in the West, has signed up for anti-council culture charters. So I don't think it's maybe as simple as people getting more left-wing or whatever. But I wonder what you thought has given rise to that sort of culture we see ourselves in now. Yeah, it's to, Luke, so I'm sorry to be... It's just too big a question. And I wrote a very good little book on it, which you should read. But anyway, but just on your left point, because it relates a bit to what Tom asked, right? Which is, that's what I'm saying is that, that it's too easy to just go, it's the rise of the left. I mean, God, the left isn't rising, right? But there is a, the form of, of one of the things that happened was that the, if you want the left abandoned believing in the audience's capacity to be won over to radical ideas, if you can get your head around that, um, which is that the, the traditional left suddenly started to think, oh God, you know, the problem with the working class, I keep voting Tory, or, you know, why are people, you know, and so on and so on. In fact, um, uh, no platform was kind of bought in by radical students very much because they thought too many people are voting for the National Front, so we're going to have to ban them rather than trying to imagine that the way to deal with this would be to try and convince them. So it was a disillusion with the democratic process, if for want of a better term. Do you know what I mean? It became a disillusion with the mass of people in society. Now the right, historically, the right, even though I've said, um, as it were, the people, you know, the, the establishment, they always thought the masses couldn't be trusted, if you see what I mean, right? Because they, they've been trying to stop the masses for forever. The surprise was when the left started doing it. The, the other thing, which is much more significant than left or right, by the way, is identity politics. You know, it's the collapse of a belief in universalism. This is very well documented um, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of postmodernism, you know, the belief, the, 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 the disillusion with universal values, the, uh, the, the, um, dis the, 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 sorry, disillusion with the grand narrative, the post-ideological period where everybody started to remove any understanding beyond uh, self and identity emerged as a kind of new way of dealing with things. And there's all sorts of reasons for that, which I haven't got time to go into. But the people who say it's the rise of the left are often people who say, you know, if only we could get rid of the left. But actually, you will notice that everybody tries to cancel everyone else. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a kind of tit for tat cancel culture. You know, every mm. I mean, you know, um, uh, what's the name? Ash Sarka. Everybody's. Uh, from uh, Novara Media, not somebody I'm particularly enthusiastic about, it has to be said, but who's on the left, right? And, you know, she is one of the people who's the kind of person who will call people out and maybe try and get them cancelled, yeah? I mean, that's the kind of allegation. And then she said, oh, did something stupid and everybody tried to get her cancelled, right? And you think, what's the good of that? I mm. mean, this is what I mean about the circular firing line, right? So all those people who sort of go, oh, all we have to do is to get rid of all those lefties, are basically being complacent and lazy because yeah. actually it's not to do with whether you're left or right. And mm. the the um the the fact that the for want of a better term that, that every institution in this country is dominated by people who seem to be you'd think they'd all done post-colonial studies, right? But actually they're all you know Oxbridge PPE graduates and all sorts of things. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean basically yeah. they bought into a narrative that is the orthodoxy and people from left to right are bought into it. And that's our problem yeah. with free speech. It's like a whole inability to just have a dialogue and to just have your views challenged really. And there's also, sorry, the other thing is vulnerability and victimhood have become valorized as uh, human attributes in a way that didn't used to be the case. And I don't mean like stiff upper lip days. I mean, until relatively recently, autonomy and uh, um, you didn't you didn't see yourself as a victim all the time. Whereas now, being a victim will get you a great deal of sympathy. It used to be seen as a sign of weakness, 
And I'm afraid feminism has contributed hugely to this, which is to my great regret. And so consequently, there's a demand that people are protected as vulnerable. So, you know, this is very different when you think, sorry, I'm, this is, I'm rambling on, but it's a good, maybe Camille Paglia makes a really good point um, about how when she was, uh, the, the American feminist writer uh, um, and public intellectual, uh, when she was uh, at uh, uh, Berkeley, there was a curfew and women were not allowed to walk across, a curfew for women who were not allowed to walk across campus at, late at night because they needed to be protected, right? This is in the 60s. So her generation, she's a bit older than me, but her generation fought to overthrow the curfew. And their slogan was, fight for the right to be raped. Now, think about that. This is radical gone mad, isn't it? Right. They wanted to have to not be protected right she didn't want to be raped in case anyone has got that and i've probably got the slogan slightly wrong now and i'll be clipped forever on bloody and destroy me but it wasn't the right to be fight she wanted they they were prepared to risk being raped to be free right because if you think about it women have fought against being overprotected you know think of the way that historically women were uh, you know kept looked after locked up almost you know had to cover themselves up and so on for protection this was the opposite of liberation and so what camille paglia said was it was very important that we were allowed to take the risk of potentially being raped if we walked across campus on our own right that was what we wanted now the demand at the same university berkeley is that women are protected by the university authorities from words that might be assaultive, assaultive, right? And that women need special protections in case anything happens to them. This isn't even against rape, this is on words. And um, in a lot of American universities, in the law departments, they've stopped teaching rape law because women say they can't, they are triggered by hearing the details of rape. This is in law schools in America and that, that this is actually bad for their mental health. I mean, you wouldn't want to have them as your defense lawyer, would you? Great help that is, right? So it's just a, a real shift in mood. And it's something I write about a lot more coherently in my book than I've just burbled on now, so. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, so I think next, um, I think Eleanor had her hand up just before Ed's, and so we'll do Eleanor and then Ed's afterwards. So there we go, Ed. Um, thank you for giving us that talk, Claire. Um, so um, yeah, I think my question, I think it was feeding into some of the stuff that you've just been talking about, but it seems to me that there's a lot of kind of confusion around people um, accusing other people of cancelling and then um, some, in some occasions, it looks like they're just exercising their free, their freedom of speech, and I don't know. It just seems like there's this very, there's like a lot of grey areas, and like at what point does freedom of speech um, become um, cancel culture? And I feel like maybe it's really context dependent, and it's not always, it's not always black and white in a lot of situations. And also, I, I, I sort of feel like um, there's a lot of people who've been saying that things have got worse with freedom of, yeah so yeah things have got worse um during uh like coronavirus and I, I in my opinion i think it's partly to do with people feeling kind of a loss of control over their lives and they're kind of looking for something to control um and it's kind of i feel like it's sort of an innate human reaction to try and find something to latch on to and control and I don't know, it's sort of a part of me feels like, can we actually blame people for actually um, kind of responding in that way? Because, um, yeah, so I don't know if that came out how I wanted it to, but. Um, just on your latter point, I mean, I've got a lot of sympathy with that because I, I wasn't trying to blame people. I think that I think that organisations have, 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 it's much more irresponsible, but I, I do understand people in a way they want to kind of like oh can't we just get on with this <laughs> i just want to know one story i mean i understand that but you know life isn't is more complicated than that as well um i also understand why people develop conspiracy theories but it doesn't mean they're right 
<laughs> I think you've got to call it out, as it were. Um, but it's not, I don't want to be too, you know, holier than thou. Why can't they see that free speech is, you know, brilliant idea. And by the way, I, you know, I quoted J.S. Mill a couple of times. Um, the Academy of Ideas is just about to launch a new project called Letters on Liberty, which is, um, you know, little pamphlets in, in the tradition of pamphleteering, trying to develop new ideas on freedom and liberty, because um, I'm aware of the fact, which is why I've tried to raise a few different things tonight, don't know how successfully, but just not the usual same old, same old, because I think that there's always a danger for people like me being at this for a long time, or even young societies like yourselves, that, that you just go, that's an attack on freedom of speech, and you expect everybody to know what you're talking about, or that somehow that itself becomes a kind of a badge of honor, you know, a kind of moral grandstanding, you know, I'm a free speech, I, I, you know, and you're censorious. And, and that doesn't seem to me to be adequate. And I think we've got to find fresh ways of arguing for free speech. And every generation needs to renew it. And I think that there's been far too much complacency. And we all quote, despite what I've just done, we all quote J.S. Mill too much. And we all sort of kind of rely on certain ways of looking at things. And I, in some ways, you know, um, nobody's asked me, but and I didn't maybe sort of push it enough, but I, I, I'm pro-vaccination and the anti-vaxxers drive me mad, but I don't agree with the Labour Party, they should be censored, but am I able to win over the arguments and what happens if I don't? And will the, 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 the you know, and so on and so forth. These are complicated issues, you know, I, I get that. I just don't like the fact that the immediate authoritarian response is free, is is, uh, is is an attack on free speech. But that doesn't mean that you just go, oh, it doesn't matter what anyone says, right? And um, you, you'll enjoy this and it's going to be filmed. So you can even, you know, I got myself into a terrible mess, which I'm not going to go into. When I kind of like, you know, had this kind of hopeless interview when I first stood as a Brexit party MEP with the Telegraph on a podcast, which I have rued the day ever since, which was in an attempt at explaining that, you know, I didn't think that free that, that every time you talked about free speech, people always talked about children and protecting children and things like child porn. And then I said, yeah, well, they always do that. And, you know, the next one, I've got a headline saying that I'm pro child porn. Right. And this has haunted me. If you've ever seen the cancellation stuff on. I mean, people actually believe I believe that. Right. But I got into a mess on it because I didn't I didn't have a good enough argument. I didn't explain what I meant sufficiently clearly, um, which is why I'm not going to try and do it now, but I mean, it's just that we need to all be better and more thoughtful. Now that sort of relates to your, your question, which is that, you know, I am credited on Wikipedia, if you can believe that, which obviously you can't, because my Wikipedia, you know, description makes me sound like an absolute monster. But I'm credited with being the person who popularized the term snowflake generation in the UK. And I actually think that possibly is true because I, when I brought out a very short little book, it was addressed to Generation Snowflake. And this was a phrase that wasn't used in the UK, it was used in America. But I thought it kind of summed something up um, quite well. I tried not to use it entirely to lampoon a generation, but I was talking about why a young generation had were so into attacking free speech and why they wanted to be safe and were you know, not doing what young people should be doing, which is kind of, you know, taking, being experimental and, you know, kind of daring and all the rest of it. And we're kind of demanding to be looked after and safe at a university, right? So I addressed it to Generation Snowflake. I, I again, one of these things where suddenly Generation Snowflake became this thing. I knew it had all gone horribly wrong when the sun set up a, a, a snowflake hotline. I thought, oh, this is the worst thing. You know, I, I wasn't trying to develop a phrase that would actually close people down by, you know, as soon as somebody says something I disagree with, you go, snowflake, snowflake. And, you know, as you know, that is how it's used. And in a way it's used to discredit people who might be raising things. And I suppose this is the danger with cancel culture as well, that it can become, you know, it's like PC gone mad. It's like woke, woke. Now I use that term all the time. I don't use it all the time, but I use it because it's become the, way that you shorthand say something, especially on social media, you say too woke or something, right? And everybody knows what you mean. And yet I hate myself for doing it and cancel culture is similar. But I do think that that um, letter from America on cancel culture was significant. I can't remember what, who, what the Harper's Magazine letter, where all those kind of left-leaning liberal liberals also wrote a letter objecting to cancel culture because the, the, even though I don't like the phrase, 
people can moan about it when they've when they've in a way been criticized you know what i mean are oh, you trying to cancel me and it's like no i'm trying to criticize you and and so on it is also the case that people have lost their jobs so there is a kind of new McCarthyism that's developed, which is people are losing their jobs for their opinions. I just used one example on the Black Lives Matters uh, issue uh, with that company. I've got there's lots of that. Some very few of those hit the headlines, by the way. They're going on all the time and people then become frightened to speak out in case they lose their jobs. That's how it works. Right. And we've all seen about, you know, JK Rowling and the whole trans issue, never mind on the race that, you know, there's all sorts of blah, blah. Right. So I, I know that that's true. But if people say to me, oh, well, um, why are you trying to you? I thought you believed in free speech, but you're objecting to so and so. So the other day, just to use an example, somebody there's a group of trolls that my trolls as well as anything else but they keep doxing is that the phrase doxing people right so this is doxing covid deniers i feel like i'm kind of verging on being like the bloody vicar at the disco now using phrases i don't understand but anyway um they basically have been posting the details of a number of psychologists who are anti-lockdown and worried about psychological damage of lockdown and worried about the increase in, in suicides. They've been labelled by this group of really unpleasant characters in my view. Uh, they've been labelled as COVID deniers and anti-vaxxers and so on. And these uh, trolls, maybe that's lazy, have been putting their, have been copying in their bosses, yeah, their employers, saying this person should be sacked doing that and uh, you know doing details and so on and so forth and i said god you know this is just a vile way <laughs> what a horrible nasty thing to do i i was defending a number of uh, two women in particular being targeted and they said oh so much for your free speech right you should be defending their free speech to do it and it's like well i wasn't trying to get them banned but you know i think this is just like when somebody if somebody came to the if i went spoke at the university and a load of people came in and shouted all the way through. And I objected to that. You could say, oh, well, I thought you believed in free speech. Why don't you let them shout all the way through? And it's like, it becomes a kind of silly game that, right? I, they don't believe in free speech. They're trying to silence people and get them sacked, right? And criticizing them isn't like where you go, no, 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 you don't believe in free speech because you, and so on. So I think that Although I think we have to be careful about throwing around terms like cancel culture, I think it is also the case that not everything is kind of free speech. Not everyone that, you know, we have to have these arguments and discussions in good faith, I suppose. Right, thank you very much. Um, Ayrton, uh, you're up next. Or Hi, Claire. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was fantastic. Definitely learned more during that than any of my American studies classes this year. So um, thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, although you were just talking about, you know, not using the words cancel culture and stuff too, um, uh, too easily, do you think that the origin of or sort of the growth of uh, you know, cancel culture and the sort of hypersensitivity, um, particularly amongst young people, um, is a product of sort of cultural complacency. It's where the f having the free speech debate um, is typical uh, can be like doing what's easy versus doing what's right. They're choosing the easy alt discussion, and it might take a few hours. You know, say um, a radical communist and a right wing libertarian um, say the communist is taking the easy way out and saying, "Oh no, you support this and this and this, and that means you're cancelled." Um, it, it it seems to me that that's uh, there's too much of a line to draw that like to ignore i don't know if you think there might have been one or a few sort of cultural entities or things that have happened recently that could have sparked that change and this sort of growth and development into complacency that uh, sort of gave rise to this um well we'll do what's easy as opposed to what's right mentality i don't know um I think that that probably is partly right. Um, I don't. I don't know that. I, it's very difficult with these things where you kind of try and pin down dates because a lot of them. But you know, one consideration is that the 
end of the Cold War is quite important because this might sound really sort of a weird thing to say, but at the end of the Cold War, um, which, by the way, in case anyone's confused about my uh, Marxist origins, I was never a Stalinist and I was glad to see the back of Eastern Europe as much <laughs> as anyone else. So um, before anyone gets confused um, on that front. But one of the things it did was it, it, it basically meant we were left in what Margaret Thatcher said, you know, was there is no alternative. You know what I mean? It was kind of great triumphalism. This is the system now. And before before that, in a bizarre sort of a way, the West had to intellectually justify itself against this other way of organizing society. So if you look at the amount of money, and you know, even like in the CIA and but loads of arts organizations were funded by the CIA actually to develop arguments for freedom, right? As against the Soviet Union or the Eastern Bloc. Because in a way it was it was a cold war, but it was that kind of war, right? So when I'd be going out selling something like Living Marks, and the people would say to me, get back to Russia. There was always this uh, sort of idea, you know, they're unfree and we, what we've got going for us in, in the West is freedom. And bizarrely, that meant that there was a lot of effort put into developing the intellectual arguments for freedom, as is distinct from over there. Then you have the end of the Cold War, and it's as though the West got complacent about the, there's no need to develop ideas on freedom anymore now because there's no op opposition. So as Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative, right? And we were told by Francis Fukuyama, it was the end of history. We were told, everybody talked about post-ideological period, ideology was no longer necessary. Politicians in, all around the West became technocratic and managerial and basically said, you know, the, these big ideological questions of left and right are no longer relevant. It's who manages best, what's most important. And so in many ways, politics got hollowed out and emptied out of any meaning. You know, there was no longer any big things to fight over. Now, there was really, but what I mean is, is that there, there therefore was a neglect of developing intellectually ideas around some of the key issues of our time. So that's one thing. Um, completely unrelated, but I'll just mention it because is that um, when I was talking about Generation Snowflake, there is a generational shift, there has been a generational shift away from a commitment to a more resilient model of personhood to, a, to as I say, to a more kind of victim orientated, I need to be protected, more infantilized version of, of, of young people. Um, but I do, I do blame my own generation for that because I, one of the things that's happened is that um, the, one of the great, one of the values, it's, it's, it's hard saying this now because we're in COVID, it sounds obvious, but one of the things I argued in the book a few years ago was just that we'd become obsessed with safety and protection and that young people were kind of reared to constantly believe that they had to be looked after and protected all the time and that things were, you know, that everything from, you know, everything was kind of talked up, you know, too much sugar and obesity epidemic. There was sugar was called, you know, the new cocaine in the House of Parliament. You know, it's like sort of ridiculous. You know what I mean? Have a bar of chocolate. Oh my God, it's going to kill you off. Generations are going to die before their parents. I mean, everything's all talked up. Um, we, we, we've, um, we're familiar with uh, um, young people not being, or children not being allowed to play out on their own as just, you know, being overprotected, what, what's become known as cotton wool kids, uh, these kind of things means that I think that we have socialized many young people into, into not being able to cope with many things, right? And there's a real kickback against this because obviously you're all young um, and not everybody's the same, but it's a generational trend, right? That's the point. That's a, a generational trend doesn't mean everyone is the same. And so there's this sort of idea that um, you need to be looked after and protected. And I do think that things like the mental health crisis in universities and so on is as a consequence of people not having a political framework through which they understand things and therefore seeing everything through the prism of themselves, not coping and being a victim. So, you know, you kind of can't cope with uh, you know, there's been all sorts of studies about the number of people who develop mental health problems because they're leaving home for the first time and they're, you know, they don't, can't pay the rent and they haven't got enough money. 
And it's like, why does that take the form of developing a mental health problem rather than joining a revolutionary group? Do you know what I mean? I mean, why does it take a narrow self form and so on and so forth? So there are big issues that I think it's have all come together in, in, in a variety of different ways. So I haven't answered your question, but maybe just added a few layers to it. No, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, I was going to, I think Naris wanted to ask something as well, so we can go next. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, what do you think makes universities uniquely vulnerable to that kind of culture, and can universities change? That's basically my question. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, well, universities are just where, where it all started, really. I mean, you know, um, partly because theoretically that's where it started, because a lot of the ideas around this were developed in universities by, by were theorized around, um, uh, obviously by academics. It's also the case, by the way, that 50% of um, the population go to British universities now. So it's kind of quite a large uh, sector of people. And, you know, whether we like it or not, you get three years where you're not, I mean, it's, it, it is quite different if you're 17, 18, and you have to go out and work in a, in, you know, as an engineer, or not engineer, that'd be a great job, you have to go and work in the sewage works, right? And your preoccupation with uh, statue toppling and post-colonial theory is probably uh, not quite, not because you're not bright, but because you really have got better things to do, do you know what I mean? Or you're too busy than to be kind of indulged in it. I don't want to be over Philistine about it or chippy, but there's an element of that. But it, it's already a protected cohort. It's already a protected space. You know, it's a place where you, it's, the thing that's just disappointing is that university should be where you experiment with ideas, not hide yourself away from them. I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a narrow uh, experimentation. But one of the things that's happened that I didn't discuss is that you know, I've been following what's happening on campus for, for, you know, for some years, and um, I'm really interested in it. I was very interested, for example, in the uh, roads must fall and followed all that and wrote about it, commented on it a lot at the time. But most people in this country have not been following the detailed, you know, post-colonial anxieties that have been going on at universities and didn't know that statues were a problem. They, no, it did, for the majority of millions of people in this country, they did not think that inanimate statues would be held responsible for every social ill in the contemporary period. And one of the things that is the, the, the way that COVID, uh, uh, the way that the George Floyd um, issue broke out in, in, in the lockdown period was that millions of ordinary people suddenly saw the campus wars spilling out into mainstream life, right? And they just didn't understand it. I mean, I remember you know, like talking to my friend, they're going, but we always loved Gone with the Wind. Do you know what I mean? Like, we like sort of we like that film. What's right? It's not are we racist, right? What is you know, it's like when the Colson statue was pulled down. It wasn't, you know, you, it's one thing saying get rid of the Colson statue. It's kind of like jumping on an inanimate statue and dragging it through the streets and ritualistically throwing it in. It was kind of like, oh my God, what happened there? Right. And then the next minute loads of statues and now there's everywhere you look there's um, uh, attempts at you know and, and people um who are not university on university campuses were less au fait with these issues and in some ways it kind of created a real has created a real um gap in society between universities and, and non-universities which is not very helpful as it happens but the other thing is is that Universities are a place where people learn to linguistically play the game. You know, you know at universities there are certain things that you can and can't say, don't you? It's almost like you're taught there a new vocabulary so that you don't make the mistake of using the wrong phrase to describe any number of uh, 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 different groups. Um, you, you might say, um, uh, you are unlikely to be aware of the pronouns issue unless you're at university. You're unlikely to be aware of the way that one negotiates uh, issues of oppression, political oppression, by the way, 
Um, but now it's become a kind of linguistic game of whether you're going to be done for saying the wrong words or not. And you become au fait. And in some ways, universities have socialised many young people into a bad faith way of dealing with politics. Because rather than the substance of how to fight racism, how to fight bigotry, how to fight for equality. I mean, when I say you wouldn't be taught that, but you know, the, the political movements that might spring up or have sprung up historically in universities, it's become much more about making sure you don't fall foul of the wrong ideas and get yourself labeled. I know people who were involved in the um, Roads Must Fall, students who were involved in Roads Must Fall, supported Roads Falling, were involved at that level, who ended up being kicked out because they said the wrong thing to the wrong person and so on and so forth. It's a kind of brutal world out there. And Brexit was a really good example of that. I spoke on Brexit at many universities, both before and after the referendum, and people could not admit that they voted Brexit in many universities. Um, that was not the mood. You know, if you voted Brexit, you were a thick, uneducated, stupid, xenophobic little Englander. And that didn't fit in with the enlightened cosmopolitan views of students. But of course, loads of students voted Brexit. It's just that they couldn't say it out loud. And so they'd all come up and say, I voted leave, but I can't tell anyone. Do you know what I mean? So this is not an atmosphere of open-minded exploration of ideas, but because it's become a kind of closed shop, people learn the rules there and that festers and therefore there's not as much rebellion. Whereas outside of universities, people are a bit more open-minded potentially although they're being taught by these university students that they've got to learn also to speak in the correct terminology or they'll be uh, dealt with or, or labelled uh, in a way that's <coughs> bad for their reputations, but anyway. Thank you, that answers my question. We've got to stop um, soon. I've got to go and have my tea. Right. Yeah, well, I, I was going to say, um, just, just one <coughs> quick thing, I thought I'd give you the opportunity if you wanted to, to ask... Um, to ask us any questions because I know you you mentioned during the talk that you wanted to see what we had to say about something. Um, so yeah, if you had any questions for us, feel feel free to ask away. And this is where we would go the bar now. <laughs> That's true. Exactly. And, in, and in the and, and, and in the absence of that, I don't want to start the whole thing again because I really really do want to go and have my tea. Yeah, no, that's but listen, fair. but listen, um, I wanted to. I do. There are there is something I want to say, which is. Um, invite me to come to speak in real life and we can go for a drink and it, it's more interactive and I've spoken far too much um, and, and I should you should have all said more but I think that's what happens when you're in the same room you just chat more and it's just a bit different yeah so I apologize for that um, but I also wanted to say that um, the Academy of Ideas and we, you know, we organise lots of different things, not just battle ideas, but also we've got this, I mean, there's now an educational charity that does this, but anyway, um, which, which was set up, um, which is something called Living Freedom, which is a residential for uh, a, a weekend residential for people to explore the history and philosophy uh, of ideas for under 25 year olds. So I just think a lot of you might really enjoy that. Now, obviously, we have to, everything's been postponed till next year, obviously, because we yeah. nothing has happened. But we will be doing all these things. So all I was going to say was, why don't we keep in touch and I can just make sure that you know about them. And yeah. um, and I, I, suppose the, I suppose the only thing is, I have um, on occasion lampooned Sussex because it's not been, it's not, it's not got a great record, does it? And uh, well, you, uh, you as a society have been at the bloody receiving end of it, but anything else is <laughs> my, my feeling. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I was going to say to you that I think I was, I've been invited, I have never been officially no platformed, but what I have been is I basically, the student union com and management have combined to make it such a bureaucratic nightmare to get me anywhere that, in the end, you know, the Free Speech Society at Leeds gave up because they were sort of 
aging rapidly, having three times, you know, Warwick University got me there on the fourth attempt, I think, but I think they were absolutely exhausted by the time I arrived. Yeah. As it had taken them so much paperwork. Is it still the case that it's that kind of bureaucratic thing that stops people being in, allowed to speak? Is that yeah, still the it, way it operates? It, it's definitely more a case of the first order of business if a speaker is, let's say, not, not wanted by perhaps the students union or, or university management. It is a case of just bringing up guidelines upon guidelines upon guidelines and just sort of bits into bureaucracy to, to sort of stop people from coming. Um, and that has been the case with some of our speakers in the past. Um, uh, yeah, so just to name like Bill Etheridge, we tried to get um, to get him to come in and that, that ended up going a similar way. Um, but luckily enough, um, my, my predecessors came up with you know, they, they came up against this, this a lot and they came up with a lot of ways to deal with it. So I personally would love to have you to come in person. I think that would be brilliant. Um, and I'm sure like where there's a will, there's a way. And yeah, no, I mean, speaking, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to work hard to get me. I just meant that's one of the things I think it was, Ellie hmm. was asking, one of the things that's difficult, Ellie, when you were asking is that, you know, is that sometimes you say, well, there's, you know people say well it's not cancel culture really it's just that you have to be careful and there's a there's a system and it just feels so dis disingenuous sometimes because you just think come on you wouldn't put those barriers it's not about me but you wouldn't put those barriers if it was somebody you wanted so there's no, there's very yeah. little explicit censorship well not there's loads but there's not um, and so the other thing i was just going to say to you is the the new um the law commissions hate crime stuff is really scary. I mean, I didn't even talk about hate crime. The, the the law commission's consultation on hate crime is really frightening. It's really, it's as bad as the Scottish hate crime bill. It's really, really gonna close down debate. Genuinely frightening. And um, a question was asked in the House of Lords about it. And the conservative minister said that she welcomed the changes and be looking forward to blah de blah right so you know guess what but the free speech union's worth keeping your eye on i don't yeah. know if you and they they they're also got some uh university project they're just starting called uh i don't know what's called free speech champions or something she would be in touch with them as well yeah no i have been keeping my eye on them actually um but yeah, I know I have just sorry, I've just realized we've been going for about an hour and a half now. I've just been so kind of engrossed in here. <laughs> um, but I, I'm sure I speak for everyone here when we say we'd, we'd love to have you when all the COVID stuff clears up um, in person. I think that would be a, be a brilliant event. Um, but yeah, I always, I always say at the end of these talks that we'd love to give you a round of applause and it just isn't the same on Zoom because <laughs> the audio doesn't really pick it up. But um, I guess in lieu of that, I'll just say thank you. Thank you so much for doing the talk. It was so kind of comprehensive and, and just uh, just brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to seeing you in real life. Have a, have a nice yeah. Christmas. Um, I'll, I'll send uh, uh, Rosie through links and things like that, Rosie. And if, if I could just get you to circulate them to people and put them on websites and things like that, yeah. yeah? And do have a look at our letters on liberty and see whether you think we've, yeah. we're have we popularizing the right kind of thing. And you might also have ideas for, they're just 3000 word essays. Like we're not trying to, mm. you know, there might be things you want to write yourself. And we're looking for respondents as well uh, for the online version. So anyway, yeah, I, I'll send yeah. you all that through. Okay, everyone, it's been a pleasure. I'm sorry I rambled on. <laughs> really no, difficult. it's been brilliant. Well, thank you so much. Well, I, can I, can read the I can read the room better when I'm in real world, but <laughs> it's a bit more difficult here. Anyway, take care, everyone. Take care. Have a good Christmas. All right, cheers. Take care. Bye-bye.